Hello everybody, Chris here, and in this Unity video, we're going to be talking about mono behavior scripts, the lifecycle um, of Unity, and the lifecycle methods that you can call from within specifically mono behavior scripts, what each of those different methods do, and why we need them. So, in general, when you have a script in Unity, it's going to be a mono behavior. Anytime you see a script attached to one of your game objects, um, as far as I know, it's always a mono behavior. There's one other type of script in uh, Unity that's specific to Unity, which is a scriptable object. But the difference is when you're creating scriptable objects, you don't attach them onto the uh, objects, but rather you create .asset files inside of your project. But yeah, the mono behaviors, those are the ones that you would see attached here. So what is a mono behavior? It's a base class for basically all the other scripts you're going to be writing inside of Unity to inherit from. Um, and aside from just allowing you to attach them to your game objects, uh, the mono behaviors have a lot of different methods inside of there that Unity knows how to interact with. So whenever Unity sees your mono behaviors, it's going to call many of these methods, or all of these methods, um, as it cycles from frame to frame. So as you have all of your scripts running inside of Unity, it's going to go from top to bottom, trying to execute all of these different methods on each of your scripts. Um, now, they're all going to get called at different times, and that's why there's more than just, say, an update method. And all of these different methods that you see here are lifecycle methods. In Visual Studio, they're actually indicated. Uh, normally, a method would be marked white, but uh, whenever you're running Unity, these lifecycle methods for mono behaviors are going to be blue, and that's one of the ways you know that you're actually running one of them. And what you would do inside of Unity is whenever you want something to happen at a specific time, you're going to probably be looking into those lifecycle methods for where you actually put your script. So for instance, uh, any mono behavior is going to have these two methods pre-written by default whenever you create a new script. So you can see update is called once per frame, uh, which means any code you have written inside of here is going to happen once per frame as your Unity Engine game runs. So for instance, at a very, very basic level, we could do something like have a float variable and we'll call it frames and set it to zero. So this runs once a frame. So we could just increment this once for every single time the update method gets called, the frames counter would go up one. A more useful example would probably be with respect to time. So time since something happened. Okay, that's a pretty bad name for a variable. We'll just call it time since. You don't want too many words. So what we can do here is say time since is going to be plus equal to time dot delta time. And what delta time is, is the time between frames. Hey, well, yeah, we can just hover it over and see the little tooltip. Uh, but yeah. Update gets called once a frame, so the time dot delta time is going to be the time since the last frame, so it makes sense to add it into um, basically an update call. So this will be the time since something, and then after it reaches a specific amount of time, we can have it do something, like fire another projectile, uh, maybe give your character an experience point, or if you have automatically accumulating resources like uh, gold, something like that. And the update um, method is going to be very useful for things like that that always need to be running. So you just check on it or update it once a frame. So when you want something to occur when your game object is created inside of the scene, so the scene loads and all of the default game objects are added there by default, or maybe the game object is added later on, but the script is attached to that game object and you want something to happen at that moment. Basically, you could say like when the enemy is first created would be a good way of thinking of it. Or when the scene first loads. Generally, that kind of stuff can go in here. Um, but the difference between private... So the difference between these two methods, awake and start, is that the awake method will be called... Uh, as soon as there's an instance of the script in the scene, it will run this whether or not the 
uh, the script is actually enabled. So if we go check out the Unity editor really quick, you can see there's a checkbox for each of these scripts. That's whether or not the script is enabled. So you can instantiate a game object where the script is enabled by default, but the awake method will still be called for that. Whereas the start method will wait until that script is actually enabled. Now, usually when you create a game object, the script is going to be enabled anyway. So in a lot of cases, these can kind of look indistinguishable from one another. But if you want something to always happen, it's probably best to put it in awake. And if you want something to wait until uh, the script itself is enabled, then it should go and start. Now, um, we got a few more that we're going to talk about in this video, but I would recommend just checking out the Unity docs. Uh, you can see that there's a whole truckload of different uh, mono behavior methods for this. And um, yeah, I, I haven't even used them all myself personally. But we'll talk about some of the ones that uh, basically I, I think you're going to use a lot because I was using them a lot. So uh, next is going to be on enable. So on enable is going to be called when the script is enabled which is similar to start, except that start only runs the first time that the script is enabled. So if you're going to be enabling and disabling things a lot, uh, then you might need to call the unenable method. So for instance, if having this script enabled disables something else or enables something else, basically toggles it, uh, a, good, a good example would be a game menu, then you probably want to put that in unenable. So when this script is enabled, disable that I mean, enable that game menu or disable that game menu, uh, that kind of thing. And then this say on disable is the exact opposite. Uh, whenever this gets unchecked, whether through a script or you clicking on it manually in the inspector, it's going to run this on disable script. And two more regarding update. Um, you probably imagine that update is really important to scripts because it is a lot of model behaviors will be using on update. Um, but late update is basically update, except everything in here happens after all the other update methods have ran. So if you have something explode in update, but you want to make sure 100% that all of those explosions and all of the different updates across all of your scripts have actually ran first, then you might need to use late update. Um, haven't needed to do that too many times, but just know that there's like an update after all the updates have ever run, and that's uh, late update. Fixed update is uh, probably going to be more commonly used. So if you're doing physics within your game, um, and you want things to happen at very specific intervals. So the difference between fixed update and update is that fixed update is only going to run a specific number of times per, uh, per second. So for instance, it could be 30 frames a second, 60 frames a second, but um, different from the on update method. If your game is allowed to run at as many frames per second as possible and how often it updates the screen and shows images to your player, um, the unupdate method may be allowed to go any number of frames per second, like you could have 200 frames or something like that. Uh, but with the fixed update, even if it's really running at 200 frames a second, the fixed number could be 60 times or 60 updates per second. And where you would use fixed update rather than update is generally with rigid body physics. It's recommended that all of your uh, rigid body calculations go into this so that all those calculations are only happening a specific number of times each second and it's not wildly changing from frame to frame because um, if you have an unlimited max frame rate on your game it could be that you have a lot of frames happening in one area but then as the screen gets cluttered your frame rate drops a lot uh, I'm sure all of you guys have played a game and experienced something like that where it gets laggy because there's just too much stuff on screen but you can avoid that with fixed update because fixed update will always run a specific number of times. And then for things like uh, rigid body physics or collisions, you may also have on trigger enter, on collision exit, um, on collision enter, um, and on trigger enter 2D methods, probably. Uh, since we're working on a 2D game here, you would use private void on trigger enter 2D 
if you're doing 2D rigid body physics. So that's the difference between those two. But what is on trigger enter or on collision enter to begin with? Well, uh, whenever you set up box colliders on your game objects, so we can see here, we have a box collider 2D. Um, and a box collider comes into contact with another box collider. Then on the mono behavior scripts, uh, as basically the game objects which those colliders are attached to, it's going to call the on trigger enter or on collision enter methods. And as soon as those box colliders leave um, the zone of the other box collider, it's going to call either on trigger exit or on collision exit. And of course, if you're dealing with 2D uh, colliders and 2D rigid bodies, it's going to be on trigger enter 2D, on trigger exit 2D. You get the idea there. Um, now, the difference between collision and trigger is that uh, basically uh, box colliders can be a trigger or they can be a regular collider. When they're set to be a trigger, they won't interact in the physics engine. So a good example of a trigger would be you walk, you walk into an area that's supposed to warp you to another zone. The collider isn't supposed to prevent you from moving into that area, but it's supposed to make a trigger event happen when you walk in. And so the difference with uh, on collision enter and on collision exit or non-trigger colliders is that generally when two non-trigger colliders interact with each other, they stop each other's movements or they apply physics to one another, uh, which could mean like a ball bumping into another ball, which transfers some of the force into that other ball. And all of that kind of physics calculation is uh, handled by the rigid body 2Ds or the rigid body um, 3Ds. Well, they're just called rigid bodies for 3D. Uh, so yeah, that's basically a bunch of different methods there. If you are going to be having box colliders, or circle colliders or any other type of collider, you're probably going to need to use these methods at some point. So just know that uh, the first time that those touch, it's on trigger enter. When they exit, it's exit. And there's also a third method, um, which you may not use too often, but on trigger stay, which is called, I believe, every frame that the colliders are still touching each other. So it's like, this is the enter point, this is while they're still in contact with each other, and this is when they leave each other. So obviously there's a bunch more um, life cycle methods that you can use inside of your mono behavior scripts, aka most of the scripts in your game. And I do recommend you give a brief look at this list. You can find it docs.unity3d.com and uh, then just look up mono behavior and you can read through these a little bit. Most of these you probably will never need to use, but it's good to know that they exist. So that's gonna be it for this brief video on uh, life cycle and mono behavior methods inside of Unity. I've been Chris, thanks for watching, and hopefully I'll see you guys in my future Unity content.